Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to CEC's English worship service. Uh, so very glad to be able to worship with everyone this morning. Um, at this time, would you all rise with me? Um, let's open our time uh, in a time of worship. Yeah. <laughs> Stand. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned.
There's a praise of your name for the things you have done. Oh, my words could not tell, not even in part of the debt of love that is owed by this thankful heart. You deserve my As we uh, come before you this morning today, uh, remembering all that you've done for us, um, Lord, there really is nothing that we can say, we can do uh, to match um, what you've done for us. Um, but Lord, may just, you know, as we think about what you have done for us, may that just transform uh, our lives, the way we think and our actions uh, to just live for you. So I uh, just thank you once again for this time, and I uh, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please have a seat. Um, I'm going to take some time to go through uh, some announcements for our church. Um, uh, first of all, we're, um, as has been for a few weeks now, uh, masks are optional, um, but we are still encouraging um, everyone to scan QR codes uh, as you guys come in so um, we can do uh, tracing if needed. Um, and just a reminder, if, if you are, you know, are feeling like under the weather or feeling sick or, you know, maybe I've gotten tested, um, let's just uh, do our best to keep everyone safe. Um, the official recommendation is to just stay home for a week um, if you are feeling under the weather. Okay. Uh, for, for the youth, uh, this Friday night you guys are having an engage night, uh, so that'll be at uh, 7.30 here at church. Um, high school retreats, uh, it's going to be at Memorial Day weekend. Um, uh, if you'd like to uh, attend, please register by by May at six. Uh, and Drake approves not studying for finance. Um, for the English congregation, uh, there are a couple of events throughout the week uh, where we can get connected with with one another outside of Sundays. Um, so Tuesdays we'll have a, a, a online prayer meeting. Uh, Wednesdays uh, we have a Young Adult Fellowship online as well. And then Friday and Sunday, we have uh, small groups and uh, Sunday school here at church. Okay, uh, there are a number of serving opportunities uh, in the English congregation. If you'd like to uh, facilitate uh, sun uh, Sunday school or be like a fellowship group leader, um, 
please have a chat with uh, Pastor Emmy. Um, he'll be able to give you more information. Okay. Um, we do have a Friday night um, uh, fellowship gathering for our children. Um, and so that has been uh, held at church for a few weeks now. Uh, if there's any questions, please uh, find Jenny. Okay, um, and going along with that, we do need uh, volunteers, f you know, to, to help engage with our, with our children. So if you have a, a heart for that, uh, if, God, if that's something that God has kind of placed on your, uh, your heart, uh, please talk to Jenny as well. Okay, um, I'm going to invite Jenny up for the VBS announcements. Uh, Ken, if you could turn on that. Good morning, CUC family. Um, welcome, and uh, great to see everybody here today. I just love seeing each and every one of you on a weekly basis, and so we're very happy that you're here joining us for uh, worship and for service. Um, I just wanted to make a really quick announcement regarding our VBS. It is coming up. It is um, about three months away, believe it or not. And so this is all information for parents, for grandparents, aunt and uncle who has uh, uh, nephews and nieces who is looking for something to do uh, during the summer. This is a great way to spend summer. It will be held in August, so it's a little later than usual. Um, but August 8th through August 12th, is our VBS dates for this year and our theme this year is make waves and so this year we are going to be talking to our kids about what it looks like to make an impact in the world that they live today how to make an impact um, in the community that they're around the people that are around them and and to help them understand how God has designed them and how he has given each and every one of our students unique talents and gifts and how to use, utilize that for God's kingdom and for our city and for our world. And so it is going to be an awesome theme. I'm really excited to um, launch this off this summer. If you have any questions for me, please feel free to contact me. My email address is up there. It's for preschoolers through fifth graders. And so if you have kids who are going into preschool, um, kids who are in fifth, uh, all the way up to fifth grade, you guys are all more than welcome to join us. Um, and I believe I have one more slide regarding our, vol our, our VBS, and it is our volunteers, uh, volunteer needs. And so we're looking for youth volunteers. We're looking for aunties and uncles and grandmas and grandpas, mom and dads who are available to come help us uh, with VBS. And so there's, as you can see, we have many teams, we have many needs. And so if you see something that's up there that you're like, hey, I'm actually really good with organizing games or <laughs> really good at like coming up with snacks and I'm very organized and so I'd like to be a part of the registration team. If there's something that's up there that you feel called to, that you're interested in, that you wanna try, um, please let me know and we can get that going for you. I will have a registration form up for both our student or for our kids and for our volunteers here shortly. And so once that is up and running, we will make another announcement for that. Um, but until um, then, if you are interested, feel free to contact me and let me know and we will get you signed up for VBS. All right, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Jenny. Um, uh, next couple of weeks, we'll actually be having a uh, combined service uh, with our uh, with the Chinese congregation downstairs. So next week's going to be a combined uh, Mother's Day uh, service. And then the following two weeks are uh, also going to be combined services where Pastor Juan's going to be uh, covering the topic of church leadership. Okay. Um, as always, we have a prayer box outside uh, in, in the foyer. Uh, we'd love to pray for you uh, if there's anything uh, you know, on your heart or that you're going through um, that you'd like prayer for, please uh, feel free to uh, fill out a, a, you know, write it down on a piece of paper and, and drop it in the box. Um, as always, Pastor Emmy is available to talk if you'd like to, um, you know, connect with him. Uh, his email and number are, are on the screen there. Um, and then just, just one uh, final announcement. We don't have a slide for this. Um, the deacon, uh, uh, board has prepared like a communication packet uh, for for the whole church. Um, those will be out uh, on the table in the foyer. So um, maybe as you're going out uh, at the end of service, uh, please feel free to uh, grab a packet. 
Okay, uh, that's it for announcements. Uh, we'll now we'll move into the fellowship time of our um, of our service. So uh, this is where you know we uh, give some time for uh, people to connect. Um, there's some refreshments out in the foyer. Um, so uh, let's all make our way out there. Um, and then after uh, after the the timer is up, uh, we can all dismiss to our respective congregations. Okay, so please go ahead. Um, let's uh, prepare our hearts as we come in prayer before the Lord today. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and this time that you have given us. We're once again amazed at your love story that you have painted on the cross in the life of your son jesus christ and it is on a day like this lord that your son rose from the day and the church met as a testimony as a reminder lord that uh, you conquered the grave that you defeated sin and that you dealt you defeated death and you dealt with sin so lord we thank you lord for all the people who are here because of the love that you have written and that you have engraved in the palm of your hands. So, Lord, we prepare and we quiet our hearts. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will examine us as we approach your table today. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we need your grace, grace upon grace, Lord Jesus, that you have brought, that we need your Holy Spirit to sanctify us in truth, we thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness and the assurance of the forgiveness of our sins that we have in you. Lord, we also pray for that which you give us. Lord, as a token of our thanksgiving and offering to you, please receive a portion of that for the sake of your kingdom expansion. May it be used wisely. We thank you, Lord, for the people who uh, are here today, and we ask, Lord, that you will touch them. We continue to pray for the turmoil around the world, situation in China and in uh, Russia and in Ukraine and in other parts of the world, in Africa, Lord. And we ask, Lord, that you continue to strengthen your people, that your spirit of comfort would be with them and that we would continue to be lights for your kingdom. We continue to pray, Lord, for the government, for the leaders of these nations, that they will turn to repentance, to know you. Lord, we pray for, uh, uh, for CEC. We pray for the new seasons that you have in store for them. Pray for people who are serving in every way, shape, or form, that you anoint them and bless them. And Lord, at this time, we pray that you quiet our hearts as we wait upon you to hear your voice and to come at your table and your invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, so um, today we have a few visitors. Uh, today, uh, Lillian, if you haven't met uh, back there, uh, Chai has invited uh, Lillian back here and she and her husband, I think they're probably taking the kids down and uh, Chai has also uh, gone with the kids, so, you know, you, you, you don't have, you can go, stay out there, you can listen from out there, Lillian. So, uh, uh, you know, just uh, as you get to know her, uh, Lillian and their family, please uh, be with them. Uh, uh, from what I understood, Viv uh, Lillian, uh, um, the Lord's put on your heart to maybe go back to Thailand and start a home church uh, around there, so... Uh, you know, they definitely need support and prayer, so uh, please speak with them as the Lord's moving them in their life. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad to see that, uh, that uh, people uh, are, are continuing to uh, be part of the work of the gospel in this world. Uh, her husband is not, he, he's with the children downstairs and Chai, so they're not present with us at this point. Uh, we're also blessed to have so many of our English people serving with the youth and with the children. 
Uh, so praise the Lord for that. Okay, so at this time, um, Wayne, can you grab me the clicker for my back? Sorry. We are transitioning uh, into uh, the second part of the year. The first, uh, the first, uh, the, the vision that we've had for this year is building up the body of Christ. And this has been the vision for our church and for, is the vision for our church. And the first four months, we kind of surrounded our preaching on Sunday mornings on building upward or building up. Now we are transitioning into building in or building inward. And the last part of the year uh, may be focusing on building out or building outward. And as we have looked at building up, uh, this came out of a conviction from a passage in Ephesians where Jesus builds up his church. And then we looked at the way of Jesus Christ from Luke chapter 6. And we saw that the way of Christ and his way of discipleship is his relationship upward with the Father, which in turn affected his relationship with those inward and prepared them to move outwards. So a full cycle of discipleship of someone who's a disciple of Jesus Christ and has the way of Jesus Christ is upward, inward, outward. And this type of discipleship that we see in the life of Jesus and Jesus' followers continues to be like a spiral. You know, uh, what is a sick type of a relationship uh, with God or, or a sick type of a, a discipleship? Or maybe, unfortunately, believe it or not, we have come into an age where we go to church and we learn a church's way, but that is not Christ's way. Christ's way may not always be seen in every church. Some churches will emphasize more the upward relationship with God. Some churches will even go into the inward. And some churches will emphasize mostly the outward. And it depends. You know, if you, if you look at the Catholic Church, for example, uh, there's some emphasis on the upward and inward, and they heavily rely more on the outward. If you look at the Presbyterian churches, for example, it's mostly upward. Some eat warm or no outward, uh, and so forth. And there's a mix in between floras, and this is not true of every church of a certain denomination, but you can see certain ways that will emphasize one for another. Now, why it is so blessed for us to be followers of Jesus Christ is because... You can have a PhD in your upward, and it doesn't mean much. And you say, well, how can that be? Because that's the relationship. Well, the relationship with God, upward, automatically moves you inward and automatically moves you outward. So it works hand in hand. You know, it's, it's, it's very beautiful to see how the way of Christ is so healthy and exemplified through his followers. Now, why do I take time to speak about this? Because sometimes you may be in a church where the way of Jesus Christ is not present. And you don't know that. You come to Christ and you're following what everyone else is doing in the church. But then I might, might not exactly be the way of Jesus Christ. But you take the name of Jesus Christ as a Christian upon you. So yes, this is the Jesus model we see with Jesus Christ, the truth, his word, and the gospel being at the core. So how do we transition, obviously, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, love one another. So there's a transition. And after you love one another, he says, love your neighbor and pray for those who persecute you. Right? So you can see this beautiful upward, inward, outward uh, 
uh, uh, reality and to the commandments that Jesus Christ has given to us uh, based on truth, exemplified through the greatest of gifts, love. And this is a cycle that a healthy follower of Jesus Christ, a complete disciple of Jesus Christ, will go through. Right? So this is, uh, uh, this is the case. Now, as we transition from building up into building in, if you were to take a guess, besides love among the relationships that you have, you know, within a family, what do you think it's a big word or something that defines how we relate to one another? I don't want to keep playing hangman or, 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 or the wheel of fortune or stuff like that. It's a word that starts with F and it ends with P. Fellowship, see? You know, fellowship, yeah. So f God uses fellowship into our scriptures to transition from having a relationship with Jesus into moving inward, into directing us inward. And for that, uh, let's all stand. We will uh, look today at uh, this transition and how it happens in a healthy way according to the model of Jesus Christ. And we will read the first four verses out of 1 John. If you are able, please uh, uh, read it together with me. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was ma manifest to that which we have her heard, we proclaim also to you. So do you have fellowship with us? And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are waiting so that our joy may be complete. Amen. You may be seated. I'm still getting dizzy, so I can't read too well. Uh, I've had the joy of passing some uh, kidney stones, so I don't wish that upon you. <coughs> and I still get a little bit dizzy. So I, it's hard for me to read sometimes. But uh, how do we look at this transition? Many scholars, some of the more solid scholars, actually believe that this book of 1 John is the very last book to be written in the Bible. John is the last apostle to be alive. Uh, uh, now, many people believe that uh, Revelation might be the last book. And uh, it's strange why they believe the first John would be the, writ the first written one, because we also have second John. And we also have third John, right? So, you know, but for some reason, scholars believe that this would be it. When we look at the Bible, how does the Bible begin in Genesis? In the beginning, God. Right? In the beginning, God. If we are to say, okay, we will respect some of your scholarly approach, and uh, maybe 1 John is the last book to be written, uh, you know, by uh, Apostle John, how does 1 John end? Can you look in, I, th I think, the fifth chapter? Uh, it has five chapters. Can someone read the last verse? It's a very short verse. It begins, in the beginning, God. It says, dear. Go ahead. Little children. Little children, okay. Keep from idols. Oh, interesting that it says, little children, keep yourself from idols it's very interesting how even when you look at those two it's building up in the beginning god y your attention and your center is upon god and as this disciple of love is writing a letter to the church he says little children keep yourselves from idols and you say well that was an issue in the Old Testament. Well, 
You know, we may not be resurrecting uh, 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 today uh, many statues, but this is how the disciple of love, the beloved disciple, is encouraging you and I, little children, keep yourselves from idols. And it's so strange. Why? Because when you read this epistle, this epistle to, uh, of John, one of the main things that you realize is that he really wants you to do what? To be assured in your salvation. That is one of the main topics that you will see. He wants you to be solidified in your salvation. Then you wonder why would he put at the ending and conclusion of this letter, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Interesting. You know, you don't have to always look at the small things, but sometimes you go, you take a, you, you take a step back and you look at the bigger picture of what is God saying and doing. And here's someone who's saved, here's someone who's walking with the Lord, here's a disciple of love, and this is his last encouragement towards us? It almost sounds like, hey, I, you know, I want you to steer clear. This, this, is, this is something that could be damaging, guys. Little children, keep yourselves away from idols and we will see how paul maybe not being as nice as other people introduces how idolatry happens in us because of the emphasis of self and guess what happens i have the knowledge of god and i can have as much knowledge about god I cannot move inwardly if I still put too much self into the equation. Self also protects you from moving into idolatry. Uh, we kind of saw that a little bit today, right, in the book of Judges. Wasn't that a, a stumbling block for Israel to move into the idolatry aspect of their life? Yes. So it's the same for us Christians. We may have knowledge of God, but... Jesus tells us as his followers, deny self, pick up your cross daily and come follow me. So we see in our relationship with Jesus that as we transition inwardly, don't let, as we transition from our relationship with God, don't let self trickle back in into the equation. This is the disciple of love. This is John who is the only apostle not to be martyr or to, dry, to die a very gruesome death, even though from history we know that he was tossed in a cauldron of boiling oil and he survived. So this is after his imprisonment sentence on the island of Patmos. By the time he wrote this, this letter, the church is getting bigger, is thriving, so guess what? He's the only apostle left. Guess what people would do? Oh, we need to get John to come preach to our church. And guess what? This, this church is looking for three pastors right now. We want a pastor like John. Do you know what we get from our historical accounts? How many of you want a pastor like John? None of you? Oh, man. You know... So they would get, and people would flock in the churches. When they heard that John was coming, guess what? There was no room. In the, this is the guy, miracles happen. He walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus. Here's an old guy. And they would put him in the front row, uh, you know, kind of the, not front row, because they didn't have churches like this. But he would come to the front, and everyone's waiting to see, what is John going to preach and say? Do you know what John would do? He will gaze like this at the church and he will say, brothers and sisters, love one another. And he would walk out of the church. 
you know what? I was thinking about that and I was saying, I think the church today needs more preachers like that. One line sermons. Well, you know, Christians are getting sick and tired of doing church. We need preachers like John. Love one another and just would walk out. Now, what would you think if you walked into a church and you, everyone's telling you, wow, someone the greatest, you know. I mean, uh, you know, maybe in this uh, situation, he's like me inviting here Tim Keller, maybe someone that this church may like. And he shows up here and he says something for 10 seconds and he steps back. And you like say, Pastor, I thought you invited Tim Keller to come preach to our church. I was already even brought up, I bought a new notebook to write as many notes as possible. If you look at the way of Christ, you say that's pretty good because that person's very committed to looking up. But I think John, in his one cent of sermons, he was saying more than just 10 seconds or 5 seconds. He was speaking a lot more because what we see is that many times a heaviness would fall over that church. What does that mean? The more I tell to say to you, the worse it gets. The more I preach to you, the weaker the condition of our upward relationship is. The less I say to you and the more it affects you, the stronger you prove to me that your relationship with God is. I don't need to tell you to love God and to do this and to have Bible studies and to read. All I would have to do is say something and if you're in that right place, it would happen. Or you would be convicted by the Spirit's presence in your life. But if I have to preach for six months on the same thing and you, you don't do it, I have to say, well, maybe that building up part is not quite reliable or good. I have to begin to have second opinions and second thoughts. So look how he starts. The son of thunder. This is the son of thunder who says, Oh, they rejected you. Should we call fire from heaven and burn this town down? Look how God has changed him to become the apostle of love. The son of thunder who wanted to destroy an entire... But it wasn't him because he said, Should we? Uh, literally, he was referring to Jesus because it wasn't like John was going to bring fire from heaven and, and kill that, that whole town, right? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon, this means studied, and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Now, you guys have heard about the Gnostics. During these days, there were believers and there were fakers in the church. The fakers, at that time, we put the name Gnostics on them. They said, oh, we're extremely spiritual and we have special knowledge. Interesting, most of those people who are fakers, they will begin to hide in their upward and twist the inward relationships. But the Lord says you will know them by their outer. Funny thing is, if you look, they're even here today. What are the Gnostics who said, well, I have special knowledge I have 
great knowledge. I know everything. Jesus, because we know that everything that's material has been corrupted and it's evil, Jesus must have been a phantom. So they began to say that, you know, people just didn't realize, but when Jesus was walking on the sand with the disciples, they didn't realize that he left no footprints. And actually, nobody ever saw Jesus eat. He was taking the food to his mouth, but he nev- no one ever saw him chew or swallow. And I wonder if every, anyone ever saw a shadow come when he walked in the sun, where sun was everyone. If everyone, any, nobody at all realized that while he was there, there was no shadow from Jesus. And there were two forms of those fakers. There were the fakers who become very ascetic to try to just deny everything that's fleshy and everything is a sin and you can go in that direction. You can be fooled. And then there's the libertarian Gnostics people who said, I'm going to be a drunkard, a, a, a womanizer, and a partier my entire life because that's not going to change my spiritual being. So those are the fakers that began to invade the church that denied the manifestation of real life within our realm, a historical presence of the one true God. Today, the same stance is taken by the Watchtower Society, by the Jehovah Witnesses. They mess up even with the translation. They add to the Bible. Those things happen. Clearly here we see articulation just the way they have twisted translating the Gospel of John and they make Jesus a God and a word mistranslating on purpose because of their ideology, because of this enemy fakers. So here we see that which, which is an articulation. It's in the neuter, it refers to the word of life. Now, before we we go further, I want to let you know just something big when you look at 1 John. The first chapter and the second chapter deal with the light of God. The third and fourth chapter deal with the love of God. And the fifth chapter deals with the life of God. John, the two biggest aspects in in the epistles of John are truth, and love and you have light and life in the middle there are big subjects for him but it is truth and love that are the major ones and the reason why truth has to be there because you can't truly know or define love unless you are in the truth so it it, it is very important for you to realize that also before we begin reading Because of Gnosis, the way of Christ in him, John, when you read the epistles, he doesn't emphasize so much the knowledge, but he says, I want you to experience. I want you to have knowledge of God, not just by your brain, but through your heart and spirit he wants us not just to have theological knowledge but to have personal experience so when you begin to see this don't make this a theological this is a testimony he began more theologically in his gospel in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Here, he's simply saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon. What is the most common word that we read so far? We. 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 It's emphasized. We. 
What is the, what's showing you right now? You don't even have to go further. If you understand the Lord and you understand testimony as God works, He is already proving it to you. This is fellowship. We. Who do you think He's referring? They're all dead. All of His other, they're all gone. I mean, not dead. They're asleep. They're with Jesus. Do you understand this transition now from a relationship with Jesus? We, they're just as present, as, as real as they always were. How present and real is Jesus to you right now? And His gospel and His word and your testimony of Him. All the hardships, all the time they have passed, all the events have not clouded that reality for John. Is something in your life departing that reality from not, uh, you know, brightening just as shine as you when you were first saved and forgiven and peace invaded you and loved by God to continue to, to let it go forward out of you? We, it's emphatic. We have looked upon, and this means more studying. We have touched with our hands. Testimony, real life. Concerning the word of life. The life. was made manifest. We have seen it and we testify to it and proclaim to you eternal, the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. We, we looked. We're not going to speak about it. Who's the only immortal? God. The emphasis to be with God is where our eternal life comes from. There is a blessing and a layer of faith and maturity when you have come to this place in your walk with God to be at peace that you are eternal because of your connection with God. And it would be different in the choices that you would make. It would be different in cases of bad news from the doctor. It would be different in how you will have an outlook in your life. And he's giving that testimony. Hey, guys, we, my brothers and sisters who have gone before me, they're well. We're together in this and we're continuing to do this thing. So he's saying, are you with me or not? Are you together with me or not? This is a very type of fellowship that we begin to see defined in scriptures than what we call fellowship at church. Oh, we think fellowship at church is, let's hang out. Let's go eat. Let's go play a game. Let's go play basketball. Let's play a board game. I mean, that's, that's nothing wrong with that. But do you think that's what defines biblical fellowship? We like to use that word. See how we, it's in our nature, the way a church can no longer have the way of Christ is the way a church can take the word fellowship and change it, but yet still call it fellowship. We see the world do that. The world doesn't call marriage what the Bible calls marriage. It even tries to redefine marriage. Don't blame the world. Let's look at us first. Do we try to redefine terms and realities in scriptures? Because I tell you what I'm beginning to see here. That it's about testifying. And it's about proclaiming. 
there are those actions that come out of us that make an entrance into fellowship with one another. Let's see if that's true or not, but I, it's clearly seen to me now, but I have a feeling that's where he's going. That which we have seen and heard, we do what? We proclaim to you. How is this fellowship entered? Through proclamation. You know what I should do right now? I should say, you know, stand up. This should be our fellowship. Yeah, not necessarily eating donuts, which were very good. Thank you, Grace. By the way, I had two or three different kinds. They were so good. You know, so in my flesh, I, 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 you know, I can be fleshy too. But true fellowship is to say, to say, you stand up and go say, I am blessed to be in the presence of a fellow proclaimer of the gospel in this world. Yeah, this is what you should do. Because you know what happens? You would really encourage one who's doing it. But you will also make someone feel very uncomfortable if they're not doing it. And you need to do that to one another so the Holy Spirit will either encourage or make someone convict of the fact that they're not fellowship with the rest of the body of Christ. You're not being compassionate if you don't encourage one another this way. So you, you too may have fellowship with us. When you go to that place, you know you're a fellow worker with Peter and Paul and John and Jan Haas and Luther and all the people who have gone before you and Billy Graham. Because you have a cloud of witnesses that have gone before you and I. Proclaiming, proclaiming is what brings you into this fellowship. It's the gateway. Hey, I'm blessed. Look how many proclaimers I have in my church. Whoo! We need to buy a new building soon. There won't be enough space here. You're laughing, KK. Why are you laughing? Oh, you're enjoying the thought? Oh, okay. Okay. I can see I can see you laugh even through the mask because I can see the face muscles laughing. I, I, I wasn't trying to make a joke. I was trying to encourage, uh, you know, the people. But, yeah. But so they, you too may have fellowship with us. Which is your reality? Who is us to you? People say, well, are you crazy? These people are gone. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying, no, not the moment the first illness heals me down and then I just need the church to baby me up before I go. No. Do you know why I have fellowship? It's because a pierced hand grabbed hold of me and says, Awake, arise. Awake from your slumber, from your deadness in the church. Arise. Because a dead flesh became alive and grabbed me. And he says, Awake, arise. And that's why I'm telling you about Jesus from the dead, he took my hand and he rose me up to life. Boy, the world will have a different view of us if the, we were this bold and this direct. No, but we try to say, well, I'm going to be nice and I'm going to try to do this and curve and maybe I want. No. A pierced hand grab, grabbed a hold of me fellowship with us and why do I you say that well fellowship partnership participation social intercourse into what and I wanted to put that to see into the proclaiming part why do you have fellowship to encourage each other how to proclaim better and how to be used in this process We know the discipleship way of Christ sometimes is lost in churches. But I venture to say, I wonder if the fellowship that we claim is fellowship in churches is exactly the same way that Jesus and John had it.
And I know it's not your fault. Do you know why? You grew up in this type of an environment in your church. And you say, well, I didn't know any better. I wish you didn't tell me, Pastor. I was pretty comfortable where I was before. I might not even come to this church again because I'll go to another church where they'll tell me nicer things. I'll feel better about myself when I leave. I just wanted you to get into the world of John. Say, what would lead a pastor to have a one-line sermon? I guarantee you John was not delusional or having dementia or Alzheimer's or he couldn't speak anymore. That is not the reason. What would make someone who's full of the Holy Spirit, the last apostle, give one-line sermons? And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. I look at this and I say, wow. It's not even the conviction that, hey, the pastor says it, the word of God says it. Uh, you know, God wants me to do this, so I have to do it. There's a beautiful transformation where there's joy in this process of doing it. Now, do you see how truth Denial, proclamation, and joy are aspects now that truly form fellowship. The way I would define fellowship is I would simply not use so much the Greek. Use the English, fellow and ship. Fellowship is you have stepped from sinking in the world, which is the water, the sea is represented in the Bible as the sinful world and its sin. You rescued Jesus through his cross, reaches down, he brings you on his ship. He is now the captain of this ship and you are on the ship of the gospel that's traveling to go back home but is saving people in this world. Fellowship, you're excited, your joy to see everyone on the ship of the gospel work together and make it go well. And do you know, as I told you many times before, Paul calls himself a hyperstasis. Ha any of you have seen the movie Ben-Hur? You see at one point he's rowing in a galley. That's what hyperstasis is. He, he says, I am a rower chained to this gospel of ship, but I don't have such an important position. I'm one of those worst chained people who's rowing. This is the position Paul takes, and he's an apostle. Do you know what we're doing with many churches? We're turning this galley of the gospel into a cruise ship, and we think, oh, church is like going on a cruise. I wonder if the ship of the gospel that Paul had is the same, you know, princess ship that I go on to. You know, I'm more technologically advanced, so I don't deal with the ship that Paul dealt with. Because I don't row chained on there and I listen to the heartbeat of Jesus and the drum. I go there and I have seafood buffet. And you can tell. I like to eat. No. Joy. Joy. What brings joy into your life? If it doesn't come from proclaiming the gospel and an effect of the fellowship, it's not true joy. We will have to redefine joy, too. Do you now understand why the Lord says those who are in Christ are a new creation? Do you understand why? It tells us, beware why you do. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And a beautiful word to understand fellowship, it tells us, you are not your 
own. Now, that's why at the end of 1 John, it makes sense. It says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It starts with letting self trickle back in. Self trickles back in. We change the way of Christ in our churches. We change the definition of fellowship. We don't realize why the fellowship has happened in churches and part took place. But then again, is this a ritual? Now we come to the Lord's table. Because I'm telling you, Jesus invited you. He says, whenever you come, take and eat. This is my body. It's not knowledge. He says it's experience. This is my body present for you. He's saying whenever you come, it is an experience. So I don't mean to pick on the Catholics, on the Orthodox. That's why they take this and they put it into a special place because they know this reality, so they say it's going to be miraculously transforming to his blood and his literal body. For you and I, we know that's a reality because we experience it. It is not me who's sharing this with you. God forbid. I need to examine myself. It is the Lord who says... Take and eat. Do it in remembrance of me. It's a proclamation of victory. You take it. Why? Because it affirms that you're a proclaimer of the word of God, that you're a proclaimer of the gospel, that you are in a fellowship with others, and that he, he is saying, Take and eat. This is my body. I'm not saying that. This is what Jesus himself is saying when you approach the Lord's table. We will partake of the body of Christ together because we are a church and we want to do it one. But please, on the cup, examine yourself. Look in that spiritual mirror to see more of Christ rather than more of you. And of self there and, and you know surrender some things to him deal with your own private relationship with the Lord but begin to think that you're not an island you're together with other people and that is for a purpose to go outward so let's uh, come forward and partake if you're if you uh, uh, if you would like to partake of the Lord's table we practice open communion here if you're a believer you're more than uh, uh, we're more than glad to have you come forward and partake. Uh, please be dismissed and come in an orderly manner. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, whenever you eat of this bread, do it in remembrance of me. For this is my body, which was broken for you. Take and eat. This is, Lord, today what we share, what we have in common. We are broken people who you put together. We are in rehab, Lord. But broken people are made whole by your stripes, by your brokenness, Lord Jesus. This is the stance that you take. 
I can't claim anything out of my own pride to say good things about myself, Lord, but I surrender myself anew to you today and to your grace of your brokenness, Lord, to fill the cracks of my life, to unify me, to declare you as the center of my life. Let's partake of the Lord's body together. In the same evening, he took the third cup of the cedar meal, the cup of redemption. He said, whenever you drink of the fruit of the vine, do it in remembrance of me. This is my blood, which was shed for you. It is the sign of a new covenant, which I will not drink it anew with you until I have you with me in heaven. That is our reality. Please examine yourself and in your own timing partake of the Lord's blood. If you're done with communion, um, let's all rise and uh, close our time with a response song. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I've proved Him. Trust. Mm-hmm.
to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, and in simple faith to Colossians 2, 6, 7, encourage us, let's receive the benediction. So just as you have received Jesus Christ, so walk in Him. Thank you, Lord, for receiving this people on your gospel ship. Lord, bless them in the fellowship of your proclaiming and your service, knowing that they belong to you. And your ship is one of victory. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. We'll uh, dismiss after more of a silent meditation. <laughs>